And thanks, Meg, for setting us up. And thanks, everyone, for joining us today. Um, this is obviously the first of many webinars that were scheduled for Wednesday, uh, 12 to 1, the first Wednesday of each month. Uh, I did want to back up and point people to our website, um, crsfumaine.edu, where you'll find most of the information that uh, we have been doing. Uh, today here obviously is focused on the forest climate change initiative. Uh, this is something I started with others uh, about two years ago. Uh, it was meant to be kind of an informal collaboration of researchers working on a topic. But obviously there's a lot of stuff happening with climate change in Maine right now with the, the Climate Council and various ongoing research initiatives. Uh, and that was kind of our intent to kind of follow up on that. If you recall way back uh, probably uh, later this, uh, early this spring, we had a um, climate uh, workshop at the university where we had 60 people come together and kind of run through a series of talks and, and, and talk about some priorities as we move forward. Uh, this was meant to be a follow-up on that, but obviously we're doing it from a virtual environment and we'll see how that goes. Uh, but I did want to highlight the general series is a partnership between this University of Maine Center for Research and Sustainable Forests, as well as the Forest Stewards Guild. Um, these are meant to be interactive dialogues. Uh, so the goal is to send out something a few days prior to have people review it, do a short overview and presentation on this, and then generate some discussion and dialogue uh, for the remainder of the hour. Uh, we've had a tremendous response to this, and I appreciate the enthusiasm and support. Um, obviously, it's nothing like an in-person meeting, but um, I think people have become accustomed to the uh, virtual environment. As Amanda suggested, uh, we'll use the chat feature, but you can also use the Q&A uh, feature. And we'll try to be responsive. If you want to speak up, that's not a problem uh, either as well, so do so. Uh, so today's uh, is our first, and we're talking about forest operations with kind of a, a virtual field tour with Keith Ganodi of the University of Forest. Uh, going forward, uh, next month we'll be talking about the carbon budget that the uh, Forest Climate Change Initiative put together for the state of Maine. In December, we'll talk about warming and changing winters, talk about some biodiversity issues in, in January, and then vulnerability, health, uh, do another virtual field tour in Scudic, uh, and then do a wrap up uh, in May with Ivan Fernandez. So I think this is a very exciting series. Obviously, it depends on having good participation across uh, various disciplines. It's not meant to be us talking to you, but more of a dialogue to address these issues together. I did want to highlight that we've asked questions of all um, for all events, and if you go to the series website you should be able to follow a frequently asked question page that will kind of keep up to date and post it uh, to address all these questions, which is meant to be uh, a living document. Okay, so on with the show. Uh, today uh, is a panelist of Keith Gnodi of the University Forest Manager, Amanda Mahaffey, uh, the Northeast Region Director of the Forest Stewards Guild, and Logan Johnson. Um, I will do a brief introduction of all three uh, and then turn it over to them. Uh, Keith Kenodi has is, is, uh, joined the university uh, about five years ago. Uh, and he oversees about 15,000 acres throughout Maine. Uh, obviously the centerpiece of the university forest is in Orno, uh, which he'll talk about a little bit today, which offers a, a variety of challenging conditions to work from just given the, the location and the general uh, history. Uh, Amanda Mahaffey uh, works with the Forest Steward Guild, has been with them for over eight years now, um, has done a variety of initiatives throughout the region, uh, all the way from uh, Foresters for the Birds to Wildland Fires, um, and has been a great partner on, on many different things. Uh, she has also uh, ran the uh, NOAX Climate Series that uh, we'll post a link to um, shortly in the chat window that, that if people haven't taken a look at, that's a really great webinar she's done. Uh, and Logan Johnson is a re recent um, MF graduate of the University of Maine, has been involved with Maine Tree as well as Forest Stewards Guild, and ha was the person that pulled together the virtual field tour in conjunction with Amanda. 
Uh, so with that, I will turn it over to Amanda and Logan and Keith for a brief overview of today's event. All right, so thank you very much for that intro, Aaron, and thanks for hosting us. And thanks, a huge shout out to Meg for doing a lot of the behind the scenes work and hurting all these cats. So uh, the format for today, we're trying to keep it interactive. We'd really love to hear from all of you. Uh, so again, keep that chat window cooking with questions. Uh, Keith is really excited to answer them for you. So if we were all in the field, I would be your cat herder trying to get everybody to stand and listen. But uh, thankfully, Logan spent an afternoon in the field with me and Keith uh, giving you a virtual field tour um, of, of the university forest. Um, so for today, in our virtual setting, uh, we're going to start with Keith giving us a nice overview with maps, which are easier to share now um, as opposed to uh, in the field, um, uh, with maps and other features, uh, kind of giving us an overview and setting the context for what we'll be talking about. Um, and then we're going to have three video clips. We're going to play a video clip and then have some reflections from Keith, and we'd love to hear questions from all of you. Um, and we'll do those kind of one at a time in interspersed Q&A. And after that, we'll have uh, space for more general questions beyond the specific uh, topics that Keith will touch on. So with that, Keith, if you're ready to share, we'd love to see what you got. Okay, um, thanks for coming, everybody. Um, I'm gonna try and share my screen here. Um, got a brief PowerPoint presentation on, oops, everybody got that? Looks good. Um, so, um, just trying to get my end of it working here. There we go. Um, yeah, so I'm the university forest manager, manage, oh, roughly 14, 15,000 acres around the state. Um, and our, we, we own kind of a shotgun blast of properties across the state. As Aaron said, most of it's concentrated here around Old Town, Orono, Bradley, Eddington area. Uh, but it, it spans the climactic zones of the state from down coastal properties down into mid coast up into Arusta County. Um, so climate variability is something we're well familiar with um, just on our land base in general and um, complicated by um, recent recent climate activity. Um, so what I'll do is I, I'll kind of kind of go through sort of our basic strategy such that it is and things we're doing to um, deal with uncertain climate, and then I'll just give a brief overview of the site we're going to look at um, with the great video clips that Logan came up with um, and filmed this out on the site. Um, so this is, uh, my wife sent me this a while back and said, this is a good indicator of your mood, inversely proportional. So when you see those plus signs, that's degrees above average temperature, um, you tend to be in a bad mood and really stressed out and you're, you're in a good mood at the, during the blue times. Um, so it's, it's um, the last few winters um, have been um, unpredictable down here. So it's, it's something we need to deal with um, here in, in the wet grounds of, uh, of central Maine. Um, so our operational goal, and you know, you have to take all this in context. I would describe our land ownership on, as on the big end of small. Um, so we're not a huge industrial landowner, but we do have uh, income objectives. We do have to make a living out here, um, and we have to make things operationally feasible for the contractors we work with. So sort of as a general statement, I'd say that our operational goal on the university forest is to extract wood from the forest efficiently with our harvests while minimizing um, environmental and regulatory risks. We don't want to cause environmental harm, and we don't want to um, run afoul of, of regulation by having um, adverse impacts that, that could cause risk to our landowner of, of, an, of regulatory action. Um, you know, the classic example being getting, getting mud in the brook or something like that. Um, given, uh, um, you know, greater climate uncertainty, um, you can call it what, what you will. Um, really what we've, we've started to think about and how I look at this is um, how can we maximize the amount of safe wood we have to harvest out there that is unlikely to run afoul of environmental or regulatory um, issues um, and how can we best manage the risks that are associated with the risky wood out there um, so wood that we try to access that has a lot of risk associated with it and the, the example that will show um, in the field, and I'll, I'll show some slides of um, coming up here, 
um, is, is what we consider, what I consider wood to be risky. So risky to access operationally, um, given the fact that we want to try and protect environmental resources and not run afoul of, of regulatory hazards. So our strategy such that it is, and um, over on the, the uh, right hand side here, this is just so stuff happens fortuitously sometimes, but my wife was had a library book out and was reading it last night and this newspaper clipping fell out from the BDN in 1981. And then it's a picture of a thermometer that's 46 degrees below zero in Kanduskeg. Um, now we get excited when it gets to 20 below zero. Um, so just an example of it says the way it was. Um, anyway, so I was thinking about this. I, I kind of thought about what it, what really is our strategy for dealing with, with, with climate um, and climate that could be changing and climate that just throws things at us anyways, rather if it's changing or not. Um, I kind of broke it down into sort of um, three different um, sort of planning horizons. There's the short term day-to-day -day reactions. Um, so this is how you react in a, in a forest operation on a daily basis. And I'll go into these a little more. Um, then there's the medium term, which is um, sort of our seasonal harvest planning level. So looking out, you know, six months, what, what, what wood are we going to put on the schedule to harvest? Um, we have our harvest schedule and how am I going to look at what wood I put on that harvest um, in terms of these risks I was talking about. And then there's sort of the long term and that, that I group is sort of things that we're going to spend money on in anticipation of the long term, things like our road infrastructure, what investments am I going to make there, um, things like keeping up to speed on what new technology is coming down the road that's going to help us that uh, people here at the university and others are, are developing and how do I get my staff up to speed on that and our, our contractors up to speed on that. So sort of three different planning horizons that I think we sort of use. Um, so the operational responses, um, harvesting, day-to-day, -day, um, short-term things. Um, we're responding to weather just like we always have. You've always needed to respond to weather um, in, in logging and forestry. Um, we're just doing more of it um, recently with the way winters have been. Um, a lot of our harvesting is winter, winter time because we've got a lot of wet soils. Um, but we're, we're doing the same things we always have. When it rains, we, you know, we may have to shut down a job or we may have to move. We're just doing, we're just doing more of that than we ever have. So flexibility seems to be um, becoming more and more important. Um, when we do have cold weather down here in the, the lower Penobscot Valley, um, the lower Penobscot Valley is, is not northern Aroostook County. Um, it's a little bit better than the coast, um, but you know, we still get cold weather. But when we, when we get cold, we, we use it. We make sure we make the most of it. Um, and that's sort of the short-term planning stuff. Again, nothing new, something people have been doing forever. Um, we just seem to be doing it more often. Um, so sort of the medium term, um, harvest planning wise, um, we always try to have some backup wood if the risk is high. Um, in our harvest plan. So if the winter doesn't turn out the way we expected to, or I need to figure out how to move someone, if we get an early breakup, something like that, I want to have a backup plan and I want to have some, some wood that's safer um, to be able to move to if we can. Um, also in the medium term, we're paying more close attention than ever to our water quality best management practices and their maintenance. Um, so planning for, um, you know, it may be great frozen conditions now, but that those conditions are likely to change and then sometime in the winter, and I'm pretty sure that's going to happen. So how do I plan those, plan those BMPs? Um, longer term, operationally, um, we're looking a lot at our road systems. Um, we don't have a whole, we don't have thousands of miles of roads, um, like a big landowner would, but we've got enough that it's a major expense for us. Um, and some things we've been working on, um, there's, there's fairly good evidence that storm intensity is increasing um, over time. So we're really aggressively working on maintenance of our road drainage systems. That means keeping up on our ditch maintenance, surfacing, uh, grading, upsizing our culverts to bigger sizes when we have opportunity. And when we don't need roads, we're putting them to bed, pulling out the drainage structures so we don't have to maintain them. The other thing we're doing a little bit is um, rethinking um, whether or not we daylight roads. Um, I think most of us know that if you 
um, move back the vegetation from the side of the road, uh, helps it dry out better, generally better for the road surface. Um, but if we, uh, if we have roads that access primarily winter ground, so wet soil areas that are primarily going to be using that road in the winter, um, keeping some shade on it keeps it frozen longer. Um, so we're starting to rethink that a little bit. Um, if a road wasn't constructed properly in the first, in the first place, putting daylight on it probably isn't going to solve it. And if we keep it shaded, maybe it keeps frozen and we can get an extra week um, into the spring. So those are sort of long-term considerations. Um, the climate variability um, has some opportunities as well. Um, last year we did some things we'd never done before because we didn't have any snow. Um, we did some pre-commercial thinning and herbicide work right in the middle of the winter, January and February. Um, did some basal bark treatments and PCT because there was no snow, so that was an opportunity. Um, we get a lot of rain on snow events down here. Um, we always have. Um, seems like we're just getting more of them. Um, but some of that rain on snow followed by cold actually froze some really wet sites really well, formed kind of an ice pavement we were able to work on. Um, so that was an opportunity we took advantage of. And we're having a drought this summer. Um, and, you know, who knows how, what that's going to mean in the long term, um, if, if summers will be drier or not, I don't know. But right now it makes for some really good operating conditions. So we're going places that we wouldn't have been able to otherwise. So that, that's sort of constant adjustment. And those are the sort of the you know short term to midterm planning type things. Um, some things that are out there have been helped us technology wise. Um, um, we do have wet areas mapping for some of our lands, um, uh, hydrology um, slash lidar divide, derived um, tool that lets us know um, how wet sites are. We've used that. Um, the lidar derived two foot contour intervals lets us have much better. Um, resolution on where unmapped drainages are and things like that on our harvest units. So it's assisted us with layout. Um, there are a lot more cut to length contractors than there used to be in hybrid systems. So processor, feller, bunch, or forwarder um, to be able to that, or do a good job of putting slash in trails and um, reducing ground uh, pressure footprints. Um, so that's been, we make use of those when we can. Um, and also I'd say that the knowledge of uh, logging contractors on how to deal with changing conditions has increased considerably. Um, again, things they've always done, um, but they've really started to understand that this has to be part of how they do business, um, keeping up with changing weather conditions. Um, what would help, I always put a plug for this, if I knew exactly what the weather was going to do one to two months from now, that would really help me with planning. That's kind of a pie in the sky thing, but um, something I'll throw out there. So our virtual harvest tour, this is a little bit about the site that we're going to actually see. Um, and then we'll play some, Logan will play some videos and we can, we can discuss those. Um, so it's a 25 acre harvest, um, uh, some uh, three stage pine shelter woods. One area you're going to see is in stage one, so the initial harvest and the other one's in stage two, so a partial release of the understory. Um, on this particular harvest, we cut about 450 cords um, using a cable skitter. Um, we actually started the harvest back in December of 2017, um, but we needed to go to another harvest unit to complete a research harvest. So we, we pulled out and then finished it the winter of 2019, 2020. Um, that was a, last winter was pretty lousy conditions in general. We didn't get a lot of deep cold. Um, and as you see, we had some risky areas to deal with. We had a significant stream crossing in this, um, some large regulated riparian areas around wetlands that you'll see. Um, and some mixed soil types from some very poorly drained mucks we had to cross um, to some well-drained tills. So that's just a little bit of overview. Um, this is the view from above. Um, for those familiar, this is Chimo Pond up here. You can see that. Um, and we had a harvest unit over here. This is our yard. Um, so we had to bring wood across the brook um, to the yard and then harvested this area along these two major wetlands. Um, so the first video clip we're gonna see here is stop one, then we're gonna stop down at the stream crossing, and then over here on the far side of the far side of the brook. So the way I kind of looked at this, again, remember where I talked about safe wood and, wood and risky wood, um, the wood over on this side of the brook, so the east side of the brook there, 
um, I considered relatively safe because we didn't have to cross the stream crossing. The soils over there are pretty good upland soils. Um, there wasn't as much risk associated with that wood as opposed to across the stream crossing with some wet soils on some of these skid trails um, near the riparian, riparian area all around it. Um, this was the, what I considered um, the risky wood um, because of these, these weak points and the, and the environmental risk that, that could have, um, that, that occurred, that, that existed on that side of the, uh, on that side of the brook crossing. Um, so that's how I kind of thought about it. Safe wood, risky wood. We were lucky to have some safe wood to work with and we'll talk about that more, how we use that in the, the presentation. Um, so good classic cable skitter. Um, and this is our stream crossing during um, installation. Um, this is our stream crossing immediately following um, removal. Um, so this is about, oh, we wrapped up around March 17th um, on this particular unit. Um, I like to try and have things done if I can, middle of March. Um, this is in our harvest unit itself. Um, pine partial overstory removal, and we did a brush saw treatment of fir um, to remove some of the fir competition that was competing with our pine. Um, little digression in the silviculture. And this is the final product of our, uh, our second stage of the three stage shelter wood. Scattered overstory, uh, still remaining to provide shade, um, released pine um, in the understory. So that's sort of a brief introduction. And I will stop sharing the screen here. There. Oh, Amanda. All right, thanks. <laughs> thanks so much, Keith. That was a great overview, and I think it sets us up nicely. Uh, for folks that tuned in a little bit late, sorry for the technical difficulties. We're all learning here. Um, but uh, we just had a brief intro from Keith, and I had a question that came into the chat window, which we'll address in a moment. Um, and then we're going to share three short video clips, like two to three minutes, with space for Q&A after each. So. If you have a question, please type it into the chat window. Um, and if you can, select uh, the, to go to all panelists and attendees so that everybody can see your question. Thank you. So the question that I saw, Keith, that came in was from Joel. And he said, Keith, how effective are alternative harvest systems, tracks, CTL, et cetera, at allowing continued harvesting when conditions deteriorate? I'd say that in my experience, they help, but they're not a panacea. Um, so there's um, there are certain points at which um, you know you'll you'll probably still have to set down a job even if you have a cut the length system um, or a track say a track skitter or something like that. Um, so I think I think we've made great strides in that area, but there's still not a substitute for good planning um, and having some flexibility in your system, is, in, in my experience. Great, thank you. And I know we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about equipment uh, in a little bit. Um, I'm not seeing other questions. So Logan, do you mind getting ready to share the first video? We have a video each from the risk, sorry, from the safe wood side, the stream crossing, and then the risky wood side. So Logan is getting ready to queue up. Um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna, I, I recognize folks' bandwidth is a little bit different. Um, so if you, if you have trouble watching the next, for the next three minutes in Zoom, um, then you can also click on this video link and go to the timestamp on your own computer um, that Logan has put in the chat window. Um, and we'll see you here in three minutes. We're going to play the video. Um, you can watch it in YouTube or, uh, or stay with us. But we'll see you in three minutes to talk about the safe wood side and uh, get your questions ready for Keith. Thanks. Thanks, Amanda. Um, again, this is Keith uh, on the safe wood side as we stop and see uh, uh, tree marked with the tree says brush. Um, so our best management practice is we use to protect water quality at this site. Um, we've got a brook, which we'll see in a minute, um, and we've got a, a minor slope coming down to the brook. Um, we used a couple of BMPs, uh, best management practices, um, one of which was winter. The sound cut out. Um, Keith, you in regards to the lower Penobscot Valley, um, this area does not have very good predictable frozen ground. Um, we can have rain at any time in the winter. Uh, we can have thaws at any time in the winter. Um, so we try to freeze trails by driving over them, um, get frost into the trails and pack brush into them. 
Uh, but one of the key parts of best management practices is they need to be maintained over time. They can get degraded, the slash can get worn out, ruts can start to develop. Um, so one of the things working with our logger um, we did was, uh, this is a painted wood sale, so we marked the wood. And while we're in here, we had some low quality hemlock that had a lot of brush on them, a lot of slash. Um, so down near the stream crossing, I just painted brush on some of these lower hemlock and our logger um, knew that after we discussed it with them that that's a tree that if you need it you can take that and stuff it in the trail it's not worth very much from an economic standpoint it's worth much more as slash in the trail so we designated some of this we didn't put everything in the in the beginning but if we needed it um, he had some brush trees he could just throw in there. Um, so the paint gun's a communication device, um, helps us tell which trees to cut. We can also use it to scrawl some other information on trees if we need them. That was also available for closeout um, when he closed out the site, if we needed to put some more brush in the trail to make sure it was stable and the exposed soil was covered up, he had these, he had these trees. Um, so that's part of our planning process is um, try and plan for the maintenance of our, our BMPs as we go along. Turns out we didn't need this one, so there it sits. Um, it'll have other values, um, diversify the stain a little bit and, and those sorts of things. All right, Keith, you want to comment on that real quick? Yeah, so I, I, I think the, one of the, a couple of themes there that are really important that I, I harp on a lot when I talk about um, harvest operations in general. One is planning, um, so having a good plan. Um, and the second is communication, um, because you, you've got a team of people that are trying to achieve the outcome. Um, they all need to make a living at the end of the day. Um, the logger, the forester, the landowner, um, and having those people work together um, to get the outcome. And um, Forrester once told me, you can't over communicate. Um, and I think that's true. So um, making sure everybody has a good understanding of the plan, um, making sure the plan is reasonable um, and everybody can actually execute it and make a living um, is, is important. Yeah, sounds good. Um, I'm not seeing questions in the chat window. Come on, people, this is your chance. And we do have two more clips um, that we're going to go through. Um, when I got to do this uh, virtual field tour with you, Keith, uh, one thing that I took home was that communication with the logger is a climate adaptation. Uh, it seemed that just your, your regular communications with the logger were really essential. Uh, Rich has a, has a question. Um, we'll, we'll get to your question in just a sec, Rich. Um, could you, uh, could you uh, tell folks here, like, how often did you communicate with the logger? Um, so, we actually communicated quite a bit on this one because the harvest had a lot of moving parts. Um, so the, the logger I work with, or we work with on this particular harvest, um, he's been doing this for a long time. He knows his business. Um, not someone you really need to babysit. Um, if it was a really low risk site and there wasn't a lot of information to relay, you know, I could check on him once a week and I know it would be fine. Um, one of the reasons I, I communicated often is I didn't want to you know, overwhelm him with all the information at once. So as the harvest kind of progressed, we needed to do different things. So I would check in and say, okay, now we're here and we're going to try this. And now we're here and going to do this. Um, you know, we have all that written in a harvest plan, but still um, it was because of the riskiness of the site, um, because of how the winter was going, um, and because of some of the complexities with needing to protect regen and how we were laying out the trails and things like that. I, I communicated much more than I normally would. Um, the texting back and forth was, was nice because um, I, in the morning, oftentimes we'd just check in and, you know, it'd be rainy. So I say, hey, Roger, what side of the brook are you working on? And he'd say, oh, yeah, I'm over on, the, over on this side of the brook crossing. So we're good. And, you know, that kind of checking in happened a lot. Great, thanks, Keith. We're getting some great questions popping into the chat window. Let's take uh, Rich's question. Uh, he says, you mentioned diversifying the site, but it looks like you're developing a single-age pine stand. Thoughts? Yep. Um, so we really take a more of a landscape approach. Um, that The intent of that particular harvest is to develop a single-age pine stand, maybe, maybe with some reserve, legacy reserves, and we take the overstory someday. Um, so our goal for that particular stand is to grow pine. You know, I have a little bit of diversity here and there from a few other species. Um, but um, on our land base in general, we don't have pine monocultures on every acre. Um, as hard as we might try, um, that's never going to happen. So 
Um, I took out all the fur from that stand, but I've got plenty of fur next door on another five acres um, that's going to be in a different different stand conditions. Um, because of our management goals, we try pretty hard to grow pine in our pine stands, but we've got a lot of other diversity spread around the land base. We don't try and cram it all onto every acre. Good question. Great, thank you, Keith. Um, we had another question come in from Molly. She's saying, could you speak to the typical role of a landowner? How much direction would you expect a landowner to give and how much is up to the discretion of a logger? That's a good question. Well, the other person I'd, I'd insert in there is the forester. So hopefully we have a forester. It doesn't happen all the time. Uh, many successful harvests happen without foresters, um, but would recommend a uh, forester to be the representative, the knowledgeable representative of the landowner. Um, I always likened it to, this is why you hire a realtor, because they're representing you in the transaction. That's why you hire a forester. Um, but um, the landowner, um, what they really need to decide on is their objectives for the harvest um, and not be afraid to uh, communicate those um, to the logger. If you're not using a forester, um, ideally you would communicate that to the forester and they would make sure that they were carried out properly. Um, but the landowner's got some responsibility to remember that it is their land, it is not the logger's land. Um, and you know, at the end of the day, they have the final say on what happens in, in their property. And they're also responsible for what happens on their property. If there's an environmental violation, it goes back to the landowner. Just another reason to have a knowledgeable party of the forester on your harvest. Yeah, the forester is meant to act as your agent as the landowner. So it's always, we definitely recommend working with a forester. Um, we had a comment about the previous question um, about texting with contractors. David just said, great to be able to text with contractors. I personally like being able to text different operators at various stages of the job. It's worth mentioning to be um, to be aware of directing the logging contractor, avoiding any perception of an employer-employee relationship or any level of liability from direction. Yep, for sure. Um, so yeah, you definitely have to be careful of that independent contractor status. Um, and when I when I have a uh, when I'm working, this is a cable skitter, so it's one person. But I'm when I'm working um, through a uh, um, you know with a larger crew, I'm generally communicating it to the foreman, or if that crew if that contractor has a forester, communicating with them, and they communicate it, communicate it to the crew. Um, there, there are certain certain things you can't cross and, and you would risk being in violation of that independent contractor status. So that is something to be wary of for sure. Yep, so let, let them understand what the outcome is and what that you need and give them some flexibility to carry it out. Yeah, and again, communication is key. Um, I see a couple of more questions related to uh, mills and operations, and after that, we're going to go to our next video segment, which uh, is the crossing. So if you'll get to, we'll, we'll be talking more about operations at that. Um, but here are two more uh, questions for you, Keith. Uh, Joel asks, from your experience, are mill quotas or delivery restrictions a barrier to operations flexibility? If so, what could what what changes could help? Um, so they they can be, um, and the, so. You know, you always have to be able to sell what, what the mill is buying um, at the moment. Um, I think having some diversity in what you have planned, um, not only site-wise, but um, species-wise, um, is always a good thing because you may run up against a quota for X, and if you can jump over here and harvest Y for a little bit, um, that, that helps. Um, can't always deal with that. Sometimes wood needs to sit around for a while before you end up sending it to the mill. Um, so that, that, that potentially can be a barrier, but um, having that sort of diverse portfolio planned out in, a, in advance gives you a little bit of an operational ability to deal with that. Great, and another question related to, uh, sorry, working with loggers. Um, Ken Canfield is asking, Keith, do you have complete control over who your logging contractor is and the equipment mix, or are you required to award the job to the highest bidder? So we do, um, in most cases, yes. Um, the particular property I was on with that um, harvest is actually privately owned by the University of Maine Foundation. So that's a private landowner. So we have, we have control over that. Um, I do have some limitations with the university um, that I have to abide by. Um, 
What we do not do um, is send stuff straight out for bid. We don't do we don't do straight bid sales. So I most of the time I have I have pretty good control, um, or at least with you know I may um, show it to a bunch of different loggers, um, but not necessarily bid it out. So I, I have quite a bit of control over that. I'm fortunate. Not everybody does. Great, thank you. Yeah. Um, I see another good question that Jim just shared, but we're going to hold that for a moment. Um, so thanks for your patience, Jim. Uh, Logan, would you mind sharing the stream crossing video? And we will pick up uh, the, the questions in just a moment. And uh, Andy Schultz, I see you're out there. Um, if you have any comments or links you want to share in the chat window on uh, working with a forester as a private landowner, you're welcome to share info in the chat window. Thanks. Elf, um, kind of standard BMPs, look for a narrow section, hard bottom, hard high banks, um, cross at a right angle if you can, get through the riparian area quickly and out of it. Um, the bumper trees are important. We tried to locate it with bumpers on either side um, to contain the hitch so it wouldn't flop over and damage the banks. And as I said, when we put these uh, uh, bridges in, we also dragged a couple of big pulpwood logs on the side of them, um, again, to make some additional bumpers to keep the hitch centered on the bridge and not to rake the banks as it went across. Um, and then we just dragged those out with the bridge and sent them in the mill so we don't lose anything from that. Um, they went with the last, the last load of wood. Things we looked for afterwards, um, looked to make sure the banks are, were still intact um, during the closeout, um, looked for any risk of uh, any exposed soil within the buffer um, that could enter. Um, that side, um, to stabilize it at the end, we dragged some of those brush hemlock in there, last thing, lopped them up, left them in the trail. It was less hay we had to lug in. Here we did bring some hay down, um, just to be doubly sure, um, and put some hay in the buffer area. Um, the, the approach, um, it's pretty shallow slope, there is some slope, but there's enough natural breaks in the topography there, there's really no need to install water bars or anything like that. Um, if that wasn't the case, we would have had to maybe do something different there, but um, recognizing the importance of having flexibility in BMPs, um, putting water bars in that probably would have done more disturbance and not any more good, so looking at the topography and being able to um, justify what we did there is why we didn't install any more diversion structures. The natural topography was enough. So the stream's probably uh, 15 feet wide and we had 20 foot bridges. I would have liked to have some that were a little bit longer, but it's what we had. Sometimes you got to deal with what you had. Um, the good thing is we had some pretty rocky banks. Um, so those set in there and once you pack snow and ice and stuff around them, they, they sort of freeze into place. Um, we didn't have any trouble getting them out. Uh, we were able to pull them all out with the skitter, put them in with the skitter. Um, we chained them to the blade and drove up to the crossing and set them down across um, so we didn't have to drag them across the across the, uh, across the the brook. Um, there's a technique for doing that where you chain it under the blade, lift it up, drive forward, and flop it down. So that's what we did for this. So we never had to drive across this until the bridges were in. All right, thank you. So uh, Jim's question actually tees nicely off of that. Um, and folks, again, please type your questions into the chat window so everybody can see them to all panelists and attendees. Um, so Jim asks, I have found there is a trade-off between a slower, lower production cable skidding operation and a faster, high production mechanized operation during inconsistent winter conditions. Why did you pick the cable operator? Let's see, I'm unmuted. Okay, in this one, um... Yeah, for our particular situation, we had a, we had a harvest that we needed the cable operator on um, for a research unit. Um, so, in those cases, we're often trying to implement for research prescriptions are often really hard to implement, and we got to give them some decent wood to get them to do it. Um, so, a nice pine shelter would um, would work pretty well um, to kind of make a compromise with that. Um, plus, we have a good relationship with this logger. Um, we knew he would be able to do what we wanted to. Um, for that first stage pine shelter wood, we wanted some soil scarification. Um, don't get a lot of that in the winter, but you get some more with the cable skitter, so that was another um, consideration. What I was worried about was on the other side, you'll see where we were releasing regeneration, um, but with a, with a careful logger, uh, one who you know knows what they're doing and is willing to um, um, 
take care and take time and you can afford to take your time when you're cutting big pine with a cable skitter. Uh, we were able to release the regeneration just fine. So that's always a trade-off. Um, so there's, there's also a trade-off of BMP wise um, with a cable skitter um, versus a mechanized system. Mechanized system, get in, get out. Cable skitter, you're much more able to jump around the stand a little bit more. Um, so the feller buncher is not going straight ahead, making trails and not going to walk back out of trail. Um, cable skitter, there's more flexibility to move them around um, from one side of the harvest unit to the other side of the harvest unit if you need to. So I guess you got to understand the, the opportunities and limitations that come with that come with each system. Great, thanks. Um, I'm going to keep an eye out for questions in the chat window. Um, while we're waiting, Keith, do you have any other comments on the stream crossing that you want folks to take away? Um, so the, the stream crossing was really one of those pinch points that makes it risky. I mean, you, you think about what you're trying to do with streams is you're trying to maintain their integrity and keep soil out of them and things like that. And what do you do with a skid trail is you put a bridge across it and run, uh, disturb, make disturbance right up to the bank. So that's where a lot of the risk happens. Um, and that's where a lot of our planning happened was trying to find the right place. Um, put it in a spot that wasn't going to make the skid too long on the other side, um, get it in right and pay a lot of attention to it. That's what I was checking on a lot was how is the stream crossing holding up? How are the uh, approaches to it holding up? Can't forget about the approaches. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, again, if you watch, if folks watch the entire virtual field trip, you get another snapshot of the approach as well as the other side of the stream. We have a question that came in. Uh, Ian says, I assume climate change is impacting fish spawning habitats and timing. Do stream protections have to be updated at all to protect fish? I wonder if the critical time to prevent silt runoff is changing or other things like that. Um, I'm not a, not a fisheries biologist. I'll just preface it with that. I have worked on fish issues a lot over the years. Um, in terms of sediment, um, there's never a good time to put sediment in a brook. Um, that shouldn't happen at all. Um, it leads to things like embeddedness of the spawning gravel, um, which are really hard for a stream to heal over time. Um, plus, it's a horrible public perception issue. Nothing will make the phone ring faster and give us a bad name in forestry like brown water. So that's, that shouldn't happen anytime, um, regardless of climate change or not. Um, I think Maine has fairly good riparian protection measures. Um, some folks may debate that, but um, I think our, our riparian protection measures um, are fairly good. Um, what I do think we need to pay a lot of attention to is our stream crossings, particularly our permanent stream crossings. Um, and there's lots of efforts underway to address that, um, making sure that um, fish habitat is protected as we install our, particularly our, uh, our permanent road infrastructure um, for wood extraction. Great point. Um, I'm not seeing another question at the moment. I think we can probably go ahead and play our Risky Woods video clip. And uh, I'm sure we'll have additional questions about the Risky Woods side and also uh, general questions after that. So Logan, if you're willing, uh, let's see that third video clip um, and Keith will be ready to answer questions after that. <laughs> So this is another one of our um, our pinch points, our, our points that made the wood on this side riskier than, than over there um, on our same main trail system here. Um, I'm standing between a couple of cedars. Um, we have interrupted fern back there. Um, those are potential indicators of wet soils. Um, and what we have here, if you dug down, you'd find this is kind of a peaty muck soil. Um, so very susceptible to rutting, um, high saturated soil. Um, so this is another one we had to pay, pay attention to. Um, and it continues over here where this arm of our main trail went. Um, and what we did on this side of the trail is we pack a whole bunch of brush into there. You can see a lot of brush has been put in that trail. Um, and we did that before we made the ruts because we knew otherwise we would make ruts. Um, so we packed that side with brush um, for a couple of reasons. We were gonna use that first and it's also on a turn um, and rutting is more, soils are more susceptible to rutting when you're turning the machinery. Um, so we, we really put the BMPs into that. Um, this trail here, we sort of have a short section here, maybe oh, a couple hundred feet where we have this peaty muck soil and then we get onto a little bit better upland. Um, so our strategy was this, with this one, um, we knew we were gonna be here second. 
Um, so we used a similar strategy as over here as we froze this and we paid attention to freezing it. So when we packed this with brush, we just ran the skitter in here and mashed down the snow and ran over some fur. And then every once in a while, at the end of the day, we go grab a hitch of wood and start to work this trail and freeze it. So we actually didn't need the brush in here because we got the, the frost built into it really well. Um, if we had some brush in reserve, some trees in reserve, if we needed the brush later on, we could have dragged them in, but we didn't need them. Um, so kind of a two-pronged strategy, again, freezing and then frozen in brush um, over there, um, which, which seemed to work out, work out pretty well. Um, but the planning piece, again, again was important. Um, there's really no way around this for sandwiched right in between the two wetlands. Ideally, we try and avoid an area like this. But sometimes you can't because the way your ownership lies or the way the water bodies lie, you, you got to cross these things sometimes. And they take a little more effort, um, but it's worth it because we didn't really have to shut down the operation to wait for them to, to dry out. We sort of planned it in and, and kept working, kept working. Again, we always had that wood on the other side in our back pocket. All right, thank you. So um, again, please, uh, yeah. So again, please type your questions into the chat window, um, and uh, we'll we'll be happy to address anything from the risky wood side. Um, uh, I don't know. Yeah, we might. Uh, I'm wondering, Keith, if you want to just show share the map again, real quick, um, so yeah. people can again be reminded of the context of the safe wood stream crossing and the risky wood to get sort of a landscape picture, and also where you were standing um, in that particular video clip. We were pretty close to the. Uh, pretty close to the, the wetland um, area and put a lot of brush in that trail. Um, so I'll see if we can just take a, another quick look at the, at the map. Um, yep. And then uh, come you... back here. Okay. Is that being shared there, Amanda? Not yet. Okay. Hang on. Here we go. Share screen. Hey, look at that. Okay. How's that? There it is. Okay. All right. so you mind, uh, yeah, so you, um, you can see the cursor there. Um, where I was standing in this final clip was right here at stop three. Um, so this is where the, the ground was kind of wet uh, coming in through here. And this is where we, we packed the brush in. Um, you know, we knew those could be problem sections of the trail. Um, so we, we used BMPs to, to address that. Um, the other thing I'll say is um, we've got riparian buffer along this. Um, we actually put this trail just outside of the 75 foot buffer. Um, we designated that as a no harvest area. Um, we legally, we would be allowed to harvest in there, but um, we decided in this case, um, for lots of reasons, um, which I won't get into here, but um, we decided to leave this as unharvested buffer, put our trails outside of that. And again, I think the point is, is um, we didn't, as, as this harvest progressed, um, as soon as we could get over to the other side here, where the wood was riskier, we started working on that and always kept some wood over here on the safer side um, to be able to go to. Um, there were a few rainy days when we, we did that. We've got those, you know, midwinter thaws, midwinter rains, and um, text in the morning to the logger and say, hey, Roger, I think you can, let's work on the east side today. And usually he'd already be over there working. Um, so I think the entire winter, as loud as it was, we only lost one, one operational day to, to weather conditions. Um, and a lot of that was having this over here. Um, fortunately, after these rains, it seems like we got a cold after that. Stuff stiffens up again and we can go back in. So, so that's where we were. I was just at stop three here on the quote unquote risky wood side. Great, thank you. Uh, you got a question from Andy Schultz. Uh, he's asking, how did you handle the economics of this harvest, considering the needs for work by the logger that didn't directly lead to sellable work, uh, wood, you know, brush BMP distribution and management? Yeah, we, we negotiated a stumpage price that takes that all into account. Um, that's part of the thing they don't teach you in forestry school is negotiation skills and, and how all that works. Um, part of it was we had him in really good wood. Um, he was cutting, you know, at that point, the hardwood pulp market was still pretty good and the pine log market was good. Um, so it, we, reached a, we reached an agreement and you know, we were upfront about what we were gonna need to do too. So we, he looked at the site, we walked it, we discussed what we need to do. Um, and it, the, uh, reached, a, reached a negotiated price that we both were happy with on the stumpage. I think we, everybody made money on this and 
as much as anybody can on a timber harvest, everyone was happy at the end. Sounds good. Um, we'll get folks. Oh, go ahead. Um, well, the way our contracts are written, without going into specifics, is we can we can renegotiate things as time goes on. Um, you know, particularly if wood prices change. We did the hardwood pulp price went down at some point. We we renegotiated prices um, midway through. That's something we like to do, but sometimes you, you have to to make it fair for everybody. Yeah, I think that's called adaptive management under the uh, the new climate reality. Yeah. So, yeah, let's see. So I'll keep an eye out for additional questions. Um, um, I'm going to, while I'm stalling here, um, if you get to watch the entire video, toward the end you'll see this list, or these two lists that I just pasted into the chat window. And again, if I see someone's question jump in, I'll jump right to it. Great. Okay. Ted has a question, but everybody else uh, keep an eye on the uh, on the, the list that I pasted in. So Ted is asking, Keith, do you have a copy of the harvest plan and the contract for these sites? Is it possible to share them? Um, I can share a harvest plan. Uh, and I can send you a blank copy of our contract. All right. Fair enough. Thank you. Okay. So um, thoughts for Keith and for folks out there. Um, so Keith, as Logan and I were synthesizing uh, our virtual field tour with you, um, we pulled out these these key points, which you'll see at the end of the uh, of the virtual field tour video. Um, so at the top again, we had climate change considerations, which are sort of like big picture perspective, and then we had a whole list of BNPs, um, and uh, these are a lot that you've discussed. Um, as we're as we're looking at uh, starting to wrap up the webinar. Are there any other, any kind of take homes or things that jump out at you that you want folks uh, who are participating today to, to take away? Yeah, I really, I really think that um, being creative um, and trying to design flexibility into your systems and processes is important. Um, you, you, you know, the, the climate's always been changing and weather's always been problematic um, and it's going to continue to be. Um, so um, really understanding um, how you can be flexible, how you can find places that are safe to be, how you can make places that are risky safer by um, paying attention to your BMPs, paying attention to your road systems, um, accessing, you know, making more risky wood safer, um, I think is important. Um, also going into it with an understanding that um, there's, there are economic limitations to this stuff. Um, the logger needs to make money, the landowner needs to make money. Um, the forester involved is often mediating those things. Um, and just having appreciation of everybody's role in this process, I think, I think is important. Great, thanks, Keith. And of course, now you got a few really good questions that are popping in. Oh, uh, Andy, this is Andy Schultz is just commenting, good timely communication between all parties is also key. Very good point. Um, so Jake is asking about the contract again. Did your original contract cover the entire time frame of the harvest, or was it updated each year? Um, he, you know, you noted that when it was over two years to complete this. Uh, when I'm guessing that wasn't the original plan. Yeah, we we did a we did a new harvest. Uh, we do usually do our contracts for a one year time frame, um, and we did a new one because too much changes in that time. We got pretty boilerplate contract language, but um, you know we needed up price, update prices and things like that because markets had changed. Um, let's see, Dana Doran's asking who made the operational decisions on BMP applications. Um, I would say I provided um, guidance and I let the logger figure out how to do it. Um, you know, again, we discussed the outcome that we wanted um, and a lot of, I left a lot of those details up to the logger to figure out how to, how to do it. Um, because of our relation, working relationship I have with this logger, we could we could talk stuff out together pretty comfortably. Um, that wasn't a that wasn't a problem. Um, but the logger is the expert at his equipment system and cutting wood and doing all of that. I know the outcome I want. I leave a lot of those technical or those you know those those micromanagement things up to them to figure out because they're they're the experts at that, not me. Yeah, and again, good communication is, is really key. Um, uh, David Wardrop is asking if you can send some info about the harvest to him since he's got a, a budding client. So you're getting okay. a lot of requests we for information. Yep. <laughs> okay. 
So um, we have just a few minutes left. Um, if you have a question, I would cue Jeopardy Music if you had it handy. But um, I encourage you to check out the full video um, at your leisure. It's definitely worth your while. Um, hopefully, we'll all get to gather out there someday uh, in the not too distant future because um, it's a really cool sight to see. Um, oh, uh, Brian asked a quick question. How long have you worked with this particular logger? Um, me personally, five years. He's worked with the on the University of Forest for at least 25. Not every winter, but um, we we have we have specific need for a cable skitter, um, and those are harder and harder to find. Um, so we like to we like to keep Roger around, so he'll do these research harvests for us. Cool. I think Rich has maybe the last question before we get to our important wrap up. If you want CEU, stick around. Um, so Rich asks. Climate change suggests that current species distribution will change. You have presented solid information on how to deal in a practical present tense. Oh, it's jumping around. Um, on, on how to deal with uh, changing weather and climate conditions. Are you considering longer term adaptations, such as directing changes in species on your site? Oh, Rich, you're, you have to watch the whole video because we have a section on red pine, but I'll let Keith address it. <laughs> um, so, um, without getting too into depth, um, our philosophy on management um, is on that landscape scale. We try and maintain a diversity of species out there. Um, and we, I'm kind of obsessed with regeneration. Um, and we, we do everything we can to try and uh, ensure that our regeneration is going to be successful because in, in my thought that that's the susceptible phase of, of species to climate change is those early young trees. Uh, once, once trees are established, um, from what I know, they're fairly robust. But you know, one reason you know we may be brush sawing fur to you know give pine a pine a jump start and things like that. Um, so just like anything, making maintaining a diverse portfolio of species out there, we've got some uh, hedge against climate change. We've got some hedge against markets. We've got some hedge against those quotas um, and those sorts of things. So maintaining diverse species on the landscape. Great job, Keith, and thanks, Amanda, Logan, and Keith for participating today. Um, we apologize for the technical dis uh, difficulty with the, the wrong link, but it sounds like we got that all sorted out, and, and the recording of this will be available at, at some point. Uh, we'll get uh, Keith's harvest plans and all the other material presentation posted on the website as well. Again, if you are interested in um, continuing forester education credits, um, Feel free to reach out to Meg or myself and, and uh, one hour should be available and, and we'll get that all squared away. Uh, for now, um, thanks for all the panelists. Uh, stay tuned for future webinars and we would definitely appreciate any feedback on this or other items as we go forward. So thank you everyone. Thank you and thanks to everybody for participating too. You had really, really great, great questions. And if you haven't seen the whole video, Logan and Amanda did a great job in putting that together. Go team. <laughs>